Did you know? Pina Park was once part of Super Mario Sunshine's hub world and not a stage. Not only are there unused portals in the park that link to the Noki Bay and Pianta Village levels, but the park also has an object dictating where Mario lands after leaving a stage. Delfino Plaza has this same object for when players re-enter the hub. The area was likely recycled into a stage due to the game's rush development, which was hastily wrapped up to help sell GameCubes. Another unused idea seems to be that Yoshi was able to talk at one point. While footage doesn't exist, a drawing done by a correspondent of the UK's NGC magazine hinted that Yoshis could talk in footage shown to the press. Speaking of Yoshi, Sunshine was once planned to have a wearable Yoshi head for Mario that would spit out water. This was a concept developers thought about adding multiple times, and at one point they even considered having water shoot directly out of Mario's mouth. An unused Yoshi nozzle can still be found in the game's files, indicating this idea got further in development than previously thought. The game's director, Yoshiaki Koizumi, also wanted to include a water rifle for Mario, but felt it might cause age ratings issues in America. He was also afraid that consumers would see it as a gun, so some changes were made. Producer Takashi Tezuka stated, Although we call it a water pistol, we tried to design it so that no associations could ever be made between it and actual weapons. So we were trying to design the weirdest and funniest gadget, which turned out to be a water tank you wear on your back. A pistol and a severed Yoshi head weren't the only ideas developers had for different flood attachments. They also considered having a nozzle resembling a firework or a sprinkler, but in the end scrapped them in order to fine-tune the four types of nozzles in the final game. Interestingly, the hover nozzle seems like it barely made it into the game. This is because the team felt it made the game too easy in some parts. In order to balance the game's difficulty, they removed Flood from the Mario action stages to give players more of a challenge. All in all, the team considered around 10 different nozzle attachments, meaning more than half of them were cut. One of these nozzles is actually referenced in unused text in the game's files. The so-called reverse nozzle, which the game points out as a temporary name, would have shot water behind Mario. The text also suggests it would give Mario a speed boost in races. It's possible this nozzle isn't just alluded to, but is still in the game's data under the title Dummy Nozzle. By loading the dummy nozzle through hacking, we can see what might have been. It's possible the idea was consolidated into the turbo nozzle, or was scrapped because it made aiming difficult. The unused text the text also suggests the reverse nozzle would break after some use, where it would be retrieved by a character named Rowney, who was possibly a human tourist that Mario would rescue. Cut dialogue also suggests the mayor would encourage Mario to help get a 5-star tourism rating for Delfino Plaza, possibly by cleaning up the plaza. The idea of using water in a Mario title came to Koizumi very early on. The team wanted to expand upon the options for the player, and used Mario's movement from Super Mario 64 as a base. When Koizumi first held the GameCube controller, he imagined using the right trigger as a water pistol, and the concept evolved from there. Koizumi wasn't the only one impressed with the GameCube controller. In a talk with Nintendo, Miyamoto stated, Get accustomed to the GameCube controller because 10 years from now, this controller will be the standard. Ironically, in the game's re-release on the Switch 18 years later, Sunshine wouldn't be fully compatible with the GameCube controller. The graffiti system may have been the first feature in the game that Nintendo experimented with, going as far back as Mario 64. In an April 2002 Famitsu interview, Miyamoto stated, the game really started once we had the graffiti system. Actually, during Mario 64's development, we had a completely blank Goomba. We had a plan to let players paint a face on the Goomba. From there, we conducted a variety of experiments. This eventually led us to where we are now, where we have given the player a lot of freedom, and they can do things such as erasing the graffiti off the road in the town. Relics of the team's experiments can be found in the game's data, such as unused pollution maps. Some of these unused pollution maps included notes by the developers, while others are creepy images featuring enemies. One of these pollution maps even features the Japanese word for stupid written on it. When Koizumi first approached Tezuka and Miyamoto about his ideas for Sunshine, he was met with some resistance. Changing Mario's clothes was controversial, but in the end, the duo gave Mario a short-sleeved shirt. Fifteen years later, Koizumi would get his wish of giving the player more clothing options with Super Mario Odyssey. Sunshine would be a continuation of Koizumi's approach to sandbox gameplay in Mario games. This style, previously seen in Mario 64, is described as having the player explore a set environment while giving them an objective to complete. It was inspired by Box Gardens, or Hakoniwa in Japan. Box Gardens focus on creating a miniaturized landscape in containers, often creating a sense of realism within them. 
Koizumi would again return to this style with Mario Odyssey. In order to get the island aesthetic right, the team examined travel brochures and pictures from island resorts, and even invited travel agents to Nintendo to discuss the resort aesthetic. Koizumi stated that some employees even took it upon themselves to research tropical life by taking vacations in Southeast Asia on their own dime. Koizumi made some of his own contributions, like physically sculpting a clay model of Isle Delfino, which helped the team visualize the island and the locations within it. Looking at the sculpture, it seems there were several changes between how Koizumi initially envisioned the island and its final look. The airstrip may have been a separate landing pad originally south of Delfino Plaza, not northeast. The white marks on the clay model might also indicate that ten levels were initially planned. Looking through the unused stage names, it seems there are several unused entries. One of them is called Scale Map, which could have been used for testing, or was a cut stage. There are also several entries that are reserved for levels, 19 in total. In an interview with Nintendo, Koizumi stated that Animal Crossing scriptwriter also helped write the dialogue for Delfino's residents. By comparing the staff role for the original Animal Crossing and Mario Sunshine, it seems this person was Makoto Wada, who also worked on series such as Star Tropics and Punch-Out. Possibly as an homage to Animal Crossing, a gyroid is present in the texture sheet for the waiting room, but is unused in the final game. Several colors of the Pianta tribe can also be found unused in the game's code. Most of the cut colors are similar to colors that were used, or are very dark-skinned. It's possible the team wanted to avoid any racial controversy, so the dark Piantas were removed from the game. Early screenshots of Mario Sunshine show some of the unused colors in action. Other ideas were scrapped during development. In trailer footage shown off at Space World 2001, a soccer ball can be seen in Isle Delfino. Looking through unused data for Sunshine, the soccer ball can be found along with a goal, which even has an animation for when the player scores. Between the trailer footage and unused animation, it's clear this idea got quite far into development. Miyamoto has stated, Game creators in general are putting so many mini-games in games today. I'm concerned that they're spending too much energy on these extra features and not enough on the larger game. Exactly why it was cut is unknown, but Miyamoto's quote may suggest some extra content was trimmed from Sunshine in order to focus on the main game. There's also a secret yellow toad under Delfino Plaza that's loaded after unlocking Pina Park. By speaking to him, Mario will say, Arrivederci! And a dialogue box will appear saying, Mario, the princess was taken that way, across the river. Mario will instantly lose all his health and respawn after losing a life. This oddity was fixed in the PAL release. It seems that Toads were planned to wear sunglasses at one point during development. An unused file named Canopiosunmegane.bmd can be found in the game, with Sun Megane meaning sunglasses. Speaking of sunglasses, when Mario is near water wearing his Shine Sprite shirt, his sunglasses do not appear in the reflection. Toads aren't the only objects hidden from the player's gaze. There are a bunch of bananas hidden above the sky over Delfino Plaza. The bananas can only be found by utilizing Yoshi's infinite flutter jump glitch. There are also some coconuts hidden in Pina Park underground, which normally can't be seen by the player. If Mario is able to move during the Pina Park cutscene, the Noki Boy and Noki Girl are missing body parts. Speaking of mistakes, error handlers are used in the game when the text that was meant to be displayed can't be found. In international versions of Sunshine, characters say, Error, message could not be loaded when there's a mix-up calling their dialogue. In the Japanese version, however, if a character's dialogue can't be brought up, they'll instead talk about the sunlight or their desire to eat some rice. In order to market the game, Nintendo pulled no stops for their main plumber. In the United States, Nintendo broke a Guinness World Record by serving the biggest plate of pasta ever. They gave out 3,265 pounds of pasta a la Mario in San Francisco, where Nintendo fans dressed as Mario dove into the pasta to find prizes, including a trip to Hawaii. Other regions had a tamer marketing plan. In Japan, Nintendo collaborated with Japan Rails by hosting a stamp rally, which rewarded players with one of three unique pin badges, or if they were lucky, a duffel bag sporting the Mario Sunshine logo. In Australia, Nintendo held several meet and greets with Mario, which was announced on their website by Charles Martinet as a disembodied Mario head.
Did you know? Sonic the Hedgehog was once teased as a playable character in Double Dash. In February 2002, Shigeru Miyamoto did a short interview with Ananova.com about the state of the GameCube sales numbers and the upcoming Mario Kart game. His final comment was, We're having a series of meetings about Mario Kart for GameCube, and we've come to the point where we'll be making some drastic changes compared to the last games. Sonic the Hedgehog might be one of the drivers. Unsurprisingly, this sparked rumors that Sonic would be a playable character in the game. When Double Dash was first shown off, however, Sonic was nowhere to be seen, and the rumor died down. The rumor resurfaced in October 2003, when screenshots leaked showing the game had unlockable characters. But when Double Dash finally came out, Sonic wasn't in the game's roster. When the game was first shown off at Space World 2001, it greatly resembled existing Mario Kart titles and was yet to be named Double Dash. Interestingly, this early preview reused Mario and Luigi's models from Super Smash Bros. Melee, an indication of how hastily it was put together. In May 2002, Miyamoto said development of the game was moving along well, but that it was being kept under wraps, as any images would give away what kind of game it is. This was clearly to hide the game's dual racer mechanics. Speaking of which, the idea to have two racers in one vehicle was inspired by motorcycle sidecars. The team at Nintendo Entertainment Analysis and Development noted how fun it was to drive in pairs, and wanted to capture that same feeling for Mario Kart. Ultimately, however, they went with a tandem arrangement, rather than having players side by side. Although Nintendo wanted to mix things up, they also didn't want to put off longtime fans. In fact, the team were so concerned about the concept of two racer vehicles that they made a single racer prototype as well. They thought about giving players the option of choosing one racer for a cart or two, but ultimately went all in on having two racers in a cart. The devs at EAD looked to all past Mario Kart games while developing Double Dash, but mostly Mario Kart 64. They'd even get together regularly and play Mario Kart 64 while making Double Dash, and hope to rectify some problems of the past. Elements that they couldn't include in Mario Kart 64 64, like full polygon graphics for the carts and characters, finally made their way into Double Dash. Animation was improved too. All four wheels on a cart could now move independently, and vehicles had believable suspension. Countless revisions were made to how a character's weight impacted vehicle movement. They also tried adding more actions for racers, but started to run out of buttons on the GameCube controller. They eventually began to question whether the game they had in front of them was still Mario Kart, and considered rebranding it as something entirely new. Things began to take shape, however, and Double Dash Dash found an identity that fit the title Mario Kart. The option to have two players controlling a single cart also made the game more accessible. Double Dash director Kiyoshi Mizuki told CVG, If you're the veteran player, you can drive the cart by sitting in the front seat, and if you're the amateur player who isn't confident enough in driving the game, or if you've never played a video game whatsoever, then you can sit on the rear seat of the cart and attack the other carts. As you may already know, Double Dash allowed for up to 16-player local multiplayer over a LAN connection, but Nintendo experimented with other kinds of connectivity as well, such as the Game Boy Advance link cable. Nintendo have yet to elaborate what these experiments entailed, but it's speculated this feature may have interacted with Mario Kart Super Circuit. Nintendo also experimented with online connectivity, allowing players to go head-to-head -head across an internet connection. However, the team at EAD believed Double Dash's frantic gameplay needed a response time faster than what current internet connections could provide. Nintendo's Shinya Takahashi even said, No company, including Nintendo, could make a perfect version of Double Dash gameplay in an online version. We have reached a high level in terms of the head-to-head -head mode, and those kinds of interesting features could never be reproduced if they were put online. This wasn't the only feature cut from Double Dash. One odd mechanic the developers experimented with was a double jump. In a Japanese interview for Nintendo's own website, design manager Suyoshi Watanabe said, It's quite sad, but we had to scrap a lot of different mechanics. Personally, I really wanted to add a double jump. In the end, even though I wanted to create something new that really broke from the past, I wanted to add things that would fit. Another cut feature is Donkey Kong's original special item. DK's special item in the final game is the Jumbo Banana, but the developers originally planned for DK to use a barrel. This would have been a throwback to the original Donkey Kong arcade game, but the team thought it didn't work as well as they'd hoped, and opted for the Jumbo Banana instead. This information comes from an interview in the UK's Nintendo Official Magazine, issue 137. Interestingly, NOM asked the game's developers about 200cc racing and non-Mario characters being added to the series. Both both of which would eventually be featured in Mario Kart 8. 
Several stages were also cut from the game. The developers originally made more than just 16 courses, but deliberately removed several to make sure every stage was truly unique. The team saw other racing games that boasted large amounts of courses, but the courses would be hard to tell apart due to similar backgrounds or course layouts, and EAD didn't want to make the same mistake. Some battle stages were also removed. Within the data of the game, the battle stages are titled Many, followed by a number. These numbers range from 1 to 8, meaning there were originally going to be 8 stages, but in the final game there were only 6, with the stages Mini 4 and Mini 6 being absent. There's also evidence that an entire mode was cut from the game. Within the game's data, there's references to a reverse cup, which would see players race the game's tracks backwards. This would be different to Mirror Mode, which inverses the courses horizontally. Menu assets referencing the reverse cup can be found in the data, as well as fully modeled reverse cup trophies for 1st, 2nd, and 3rd place. There's a few more interesting details in the game's data. In the file mram.arc, the Spiny Shells file name is Item Cora Yellow. This indicates that Spiny Shells, known as Blue Shells by fans, were planned to be yellow at some point. An earlier demo version of Double Dash also has several assets that went unused in the final game, including some hidden ending graphics that say exciting ending and peace. Some unused content can be seen in early screenshots as well. An early build of Waluigi Stadium featured duplicate Marios, Luigis, Warios, and Waluigis in the audience. This audience was likely just a placeholder, and was changed in the final game to minor characters who could be repeated over and over without breaking the player's immersion. When this version of the game was demoed at E3 2003, many were impressed with the game, but criticized it for feeling too slow. Nintendo took this criticism on board, and sped the game up in a new demonstration just a few months later. Interestingly, however, the slower demo had higher speeds on its speedometer. There's a few interesting secrets in the final game as well. In the golden parade cart that's unlocked by winning the All Cup Tour in Mirror Mode is the only cart in the game that CPU opponents will never pick. The layout of the Luigi circuit is possibly based on the AVUS circuit in Berlin, Germany. Aside from the differences in length, the circuits have the same shape, and steep bankings at either end. The battle stage Block City also has a secret. The stage may be named after a poem by Robert Louis Stevenson, which describes a city made from children's toys. The GameCube battle stage also got some real-life representation in Japan, where Club Nintendo offered an exclusive decal for the top of the system that made it look like the GameCube stage in the game. Another secret can be found in the final game by finishing a time trial, then pressing L, R, L, R, X, Y, X, Y, Z on the options screen. Doing this in any version of the game brings up a code. Interestingly, however, these codes were only ever used in Japan for a Club Nintendo contest. To enter, players would choose any combination of character and cart they wanted, then try to get the best possible times in Luigi Circuit, Baby Park, Mario Circuit, and Yoshi Circuit. Then they'd register their name and code with Club Nintendo, and if the player were picked, they'd have to send in a replay of their race on a memory card to confirm they were the winner. Entrants could register register multiple codes, with anyone participating getting 5 Club Nintendo points, or anyone who ranked 3rd or higher on a course got their replay posted on the contest website. Although there could theoretically have been 4 winners, all 4 course records were set by just one player named Tagaki Nobuo. During the period between the game's reveal and its release, there was a fair amount of baseless speculation. One of the most prominent rumors circulated in 2003, which said Double Dash would release with a bonus disc containing Mario Kart 64 in its entirety. This rumor was first published in Electronic Gaming Monthly, where EGM talked about how they'd heard of the bonus disc bundle. They compared it to the Ocarina of Time bonus disc, which was a pre-order bonus for the Wind Waker, and was directly bundled with Wind Waker and PAL regions. This speculation was put to rest in Nintendo Official Magazine issue 133, where Nintendo of Europe's Marco Hine shot down the rumors, stating it wouldn't make sense to bundle two nearly identical games together. Double Dash did end up being bundled with a bonus disc, but the disc only had demos and videos for upcoming games. Everyone's had that moment playing Mario Party. The game just started, everybody picked a character and board, now the dice is spinning over your head. And you wonder if the die roll you're about to make is actually random, or if there's some trick to stopping it on the number you want. Or maybe the game even had the number picked before you hit the button. We actually touched on this topic back in 2016 with a tweet about Mario Party's dice being predetermined. Although we were pretty convinced the tweet was accurate, it garnered a lot of disagreement and skepticism as to whether the dice were rigged. So we figured we'd revisit the subject 
and try digging up a more definitive answer by doing some tests and talking to experts. So let's investigate if there's really some secret technique to Mario Party's dice, if it's just dumb luck, or find out if the dice are actually rigged. In a game of Mario Party, a good die roll can mean the difference between winning and losing. If you roll the highest dice at the start, you'll take your turn first for the entire game, giving you first dibs on buying stars before anyone else, and reacting to changes on the game board. And of course, good rolls each turn let you move farther on the board and give you more to work with. So as you can see, it's worth understanding how the dice actually work in Mario Party games. In the original Mario Party, the dice spins over your head until you jump and stop it with the A button. The game lets you decide when to jump, so most fans assume this agency means they have some control over their own destiny. And with proper timing, it looks like you can stop the dice on any number you want. But is that actually true? To see if this was the case, we investigated whether skill was involved by testing if identical circumstances yielded identical results. To do this, we'd use an emulator for easier testing and comb over videos frame by frame to confirm the timing. We'd also only look at standard dice in Mario Party. Over the series' history, there have been many gimmick dice that let players influence how far they move in a turn. There's also different kinds of roles, such as the chance time, where players could steal or lose stars and coins. So, to keep things simple, we're only running tests on the basic roles. When we recorded our tests with the emulator, we managed to hit the A button on the exact same frame quite a few times. For accuracy's sake, we did this across a 50-turn game and reloaded the same saved playthrough from the start with the same characters and board, replaying it several times, and observed if the frame-perfect hits stopped the dice on the same numbers. We not only looked at hits that were an exact number of frames from the start of the dice scene, but also hits that lined up with visual cues, such as every jump that took off when the die showed a 6. If we got the same number every time for each either of these parameters, it would suggest there is in fact skill involved, but that's not what we found. The resulting numbers from all the turns were completely random. No matter when we hit the A button, it had no influence whatsoever on the roll of the dice. In other words, the element of skill seems to be just an illusion, probably implemented because the developers thought it was more fun to hit a die than just seeing random numbers appear. But that brings us to our next point. Are the numbers actually random? Well, sort of, but in more absolute terms, no, not at all. Mario Party's dice rolls are determined by a random number generator, also known as RNG. Despite the name, RNG doesn't generate truly random numbers. It's a computer program that actually brings up numbers that appear to be random. Computers have a hard time producing truly random numbers, since they're basically just machines that follow commands. So instead, they rely on RNG formulas that essentially cycle through predetermined lists of possible results. In other words, if you play long enough, you'll get the same series of dice rolls again and again, as the cycle eventually repeats itself. Manipulating RNG in a game is possible. Maybe you've seen it done for world building in Minecraft or for catching shinies in Pokemon. It's even been found in games like Super Mario 64 that the RNG formula used to determine things like a Goomba's walk direction or how a coin falls uses somewhat simplistic variables. Unfortunately, however, although it's theoretically possible to work out what dice rolls will come up, even the world's best Mario partiers haven't figured out how to manipulate the dice. Did you know gaming spoke with world record speedrunner Airshock22, who told us, In a game like Mario Party, RNG is an invisible force that players are subjected to. Unfortunately, as of making this video, there doesn't seem to be a consistent way to manipulate it like other N64 titles. In the original Mario Party, the game actually determines the roll of the dice on the results screen of a minigame. So instead of deciding the dice rolls one by one, and at different times, the game actually decides all four players at once. By reloading save files at particular instances, we can see that no matter how long each player waits on the dice rolling screen, the result will always be the same. In other words, Mario Party's dice are in fact predetermined. You can't control them with time jumps, and they're not random either. Essentially, they're rigged. In the original Mario Party, the dice are predetermined at the end of the minigame results screen, meaning nothing between the last game and the next can influence the dice roll. No matter how long you wait to roll in the original Mario Party, you cannot change the outcome of the dice. Or at least that's the case for the original Mario Party on Nintendo 64. But what about all the sequels? We also investigated Mario Parties 2 through 10, the handheld parties, and finally, Super Mario Party on Switch, and we discovered the four forces that govern their dice are different in each game, except Mario Party DS, which actually follows the same rules as the original, despite being made about 10 games after. Going back to the N64, Mario Party 2 and 3 use a more sophisticated system, where the RNG is continually recalculated while the player waits to hit the A button and stop the dice. To confirm, we repeated the same experiment we did with the first game, and analyzed footage frame by frame, and also spoke with some seasoned Mario Partiers who provided further confirmation. We noticed that the number that was 
is displayed on the dice whenever the player hits it, and the number that's used for the actual rolling is usually different. We spoke with Zoomzike, a passionate Mario Party analyst who provided further confirmation. Zoomzike told us, The shuffling numbers you see aren't accurate reflections of the computations the game is running on your dice block. There's no skill or timing involved, as you can't even see what number the game will give you. But they're certainly less rigged than Mario Party 1 and Mario Party DS, as players have some sort of control over them. The dice mechanics in Mario Party 4 through 8 appear to be a little different, but in reality they're the same as Mario Party 2 and 3. Instead of the numbers on the dice changing 30 times a second, they only change 10 times a second, except for Mario Party 8 where they change 15 times a second. The slower speed makes you think you've got a more realistic chance of stopping the dice on the number you want, but the results are still 100% determined by the RNG. Even with frame-perfect inputs, it's impossible to hit the dice on a specific number. This is because the dice don't stop until the end of your jump animation, which takes longer than one-tenth of a second, and since the numbers don't loop in any recognizable pattern, the results are entirely out of your control. In some cases, your jump animation can take up to 500 milliseconds, which depending on the game, could mean the numbers on the dice will change five additional times before you can actually touch them. Since the number changes aren't in a discernible pattern, the number you roll is de facto random. Mario Party Advance is pretty unique in terms of gameplay and its dice roll. The handheld title is notable, as it's the only Mario Party that's really designed for a single-player experience. Because of this, we thought for sure that the dice would be different in this title. After investigating it, we discovered that Mario Party Advance has random rolls as well, with a major caveat. At the very start, the game guarantees to give you high rolls to help you get through the game's single-player tutorial. Once you're through that tutorial, though, the game uses pure RNG, letting you learn the ropes before throwing you in the deep end. Mario Party 6 is pretty unique, or at least it pretends to be. The game came bundled with a microphone, and in-game hints claim that shouting a number into the mic during solo mode will influence the dice rolls, but some speedrunners we spoke with insist that shouting into the mic doesn't actually produce any noticeable results, and we had the exact same experience playing the game ourselves. So instead of innovating the series with a new shout for luck mechanic, it appears Mario Party 6 is just the game that works the hardest to give a false sense of dice control. Mario Party 9 on Wii, Mario Party 10 on the Wii U, and Island Tour on 3DS introduced physics-based dice. In 9 and 10, after you hit the dice, it falls from the sky and rolls around the screen. And in Tour, you flick the dice from the bottom screen and it rolls up to the top screen. But in both games, the results are still determined by RNG. They've just got a new way of delivering pseudo-random numbers in a way that looks like you've got some control over the situation. But it's still just an illusion, although arguably a more satisfying one. As for Super Mario Party on Switch, there was a popular rumor started in a YouTube video that claimed you could guarantee high rolls by listening and reacting to a key sound while the dice is rolling. We were skeptical, so we tested the theory ourselves, but we couldn't reproduce the results alleged in the video. So we reached out to speedrunner Airshock22 again, who'd done some tests of his own. He said, Imagine the dice rolling audio like a wave or bell curve. The top of the bell curve is the highest in pitch in the audio. I hit the dice block in approximately the same place near the top of the bell curve every time. I got different numbers each time. It seems that even the rumor video doesn't hit the dice at consistent points. Sometimes it's at the top, but other times he will hit it when there's barely any audio. He's just selecting all the clips of him getting high numbers and claiming he hit it at the top of the audio cue. From what I can see, the sound theory is debunked and is not true. In reality, Super Mario Party utilizes a similar formula as 2 through 8, with the RNG continually recalculating before you stop the die. Although the game is different from the earlier games, due to every character having their own unique dice with different values. As each character has different probabilities, there's actually a dice tier list, which means some characters roll higher numbers on average, like Wario and Daisy, while others roll lower numbers, like Yoshi and Rosalina. So at least there's some strategy there. From what we found, not a single dice roll in the entire series actually involves any skill whatsoever. No amount of timing, listening to audio cues, or shouting into a microphone gives you any control over your own destiny. And the dice rolls aren't true truly random either. Instead, they rely on artificial randomness produced by different systems of RNG that vary in complexity. But to be fair, that's how pretty much every video game operates. Some dice are just flat out predetermined, especially early in the series. But later games' as more sophisticated RNG produce results that were arguably less predetermined. Whether you want to call Mario Party's dice rigged or not depends on the game, and if you want to get philosophical about it, the term rigged is sort of in the eye of the beholder.
Did you know? An official HD port of Mario Kart Wii was actually finished years ago, but due to government hang-ups was never released. The original Mario Kart Wii was only capable of running in a 480p resolution, but at the 2018 China Joy Expo in Shanghai, Nintendo partnered with NVIDIA to showcase a 1080p version running on the NVIDIA Shield TV. This is a Chinese device that's already had several other Wii ports in HD, including a port of Twilight Princess that's graphically superior to even the HD re-release on Wii U. The Shield version featured online capabilities that haven't been available in the Wii version since servers shut down in 2014, including time trial leaderboards and online races for up to 12 players. Following the announcement, some die-hard Mario Kart fans imported Chinese shields in anticipation of the game's release, but to their disappointment, Mario Kart HD was never seen again. According to an NVIDIA developer whose name will keep anonymous, the port was done a long time ago. It was submitted for Chinese government approval in 2018, around the time of the government's reorganization. The government asked us to change some game content a few months later. Just some translations, nothing major, but we haven't heard anything back since then. We want the game to be released as much as everybody else, but it seems like it's stuck in government limbo now. NVIDIA isn't just Nintendo's partner when it comes to HD ports for China. The two companies also partner to develop the Switch, which is powered by NVIDIA's Tegra processor. Two years after Mario Galaxy HD released on the Shield, the game landed on Switch in the form of 3D All-Stars. With that precedent in mind, Mario Kart Wii HD might find its way to the Switch some day, especially if the Shield version ever escapes Limbo. When Mario Kart Wii first entered development, the devs had a slightly different vision for the game, with many of their ideas being cut. The game is internally named Revo Kart, with Revo being a nod to Revolution, the Wii's original name. Series producer Hideki Kono originally wanted to call it Mario Kart X, with the X signifying a focus on extreme sports. In a 2008 interview, he said, I love BMX bicycles and snowboarding. When we made Mario Kart DS, we wanted to put in some elements of extreme sports so the players could do some rough riding, but it was difficult to achieve in a handheld game. That's why we decided to make it happen for the Wii. But Mario creator Shigeru Miyamoto flat out rejected the idea of BMX bikes, as he didn't like the idea of Mario riding a bicycle. Motor bikes were introduced instead, and half pipes were implemented into many of the tracks. Kono's love of snowboarding also led to the creation of the DK Summit stage. According to the game's director, Yasuyuki Oyagi, motor bikes once controlled exactly the same as carts, so he felt they weren't worth including. But after his team came up with the idea of popping wheelies, they decided bikes were worthy of Edition. Like most Mario Kart games, the sound staff recorded the kart sounds at a real racetrack, but when the time came to collect bike sound effects, they relied on Nintendo's own parking lot. Sound artist Asuka Oda said, We approached some Nintendo employees who rode motorbikes and asked them, Could you let us sample your bike? It's worth noting that despite Miyamoto cringing at the idea of Mario on a bicycle, Mario did end up riding a bike in another game released the same year, Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games. Throughout development, the Mario Kart team tested about 30 different wheel prototypes before settling on the Wii wheel we know today. They checked out some real-life go-karts and realized that instead of round steering wheels, most of them were actually square-shaped, so they went with a true-to-life wheel in the shape of a square. But they eventually scrapped the idea and decided a circular wheel would be easier to understand, and after many revisions, reduced its weight so players' arms didn't get tired holding it up during long play sessions. After Nintendo revealed their Wii wheel prototypes in 2008, fans recreated some of them using 3D printers and shared the blueprints online. They even developed some original designs of their own, all of which are available to the public and free to 3D print. Some gaming companies jumped on board as well, and more than a decade later, you can still find some high-end Wii wheels on Amazon, like the three-pound mounted wheel by Dream Gear. Mario Kart Wii's internal data and pre-release screenshots revealed even more scrapped ideas, including characters, items, and an entire game mode. Two drivers from Double Dash, Paratroopers, and PD Piranha were included in early builds, but didn't make it to the final cut. Hammer Bros were once planned as a new addition to the roster, but after getting cut from Mario Kart Wii, they didn't make their series debut until 10 years later in Mario Kart Tour. The Chain Chomp item from Double Dash can also be found in the game's data, along with some beta racetracks, like an early version of Bowser's Castle labeled Course.0. There's also the Double Dash version of Mario's circuit, albeit with a few small differences, which the developers probably used for testing. One bizarre-looking track is labeled Draw Underscore Demo, and is nearly identical to the Wii version of Mario's circuit, but with corrupted textures. In addition to all the usual modes like Grand Prix and Time Trials, Mario Kart DS also introduced a brand new mission mode, where players were offered a variety of challenges like collecting coins, mowing down enemies, and battling bosses like Big Babom. Each mission awarded players with a 1, 2, or 3 star rank based on performance, adding some extra replayability. In 2017, a modder named Mr. Bean 35000 vr discovered an unused mission mode hiding in Mario Kart Wii's internal data, with objectives like collecting 
collecting item boxes before time runs out, pulling off a string of mini turbos, drifts and slipstreams, and fighting bosses. However, it appears mission mode was cut from the game to make room for tournaments, a game mode that unfortunately can't even be played anymore. Starting in May 2008, Nintendo released two downloadable tournaments per month via the Wii's Mario Kart channel. The first tournament was a Mario Circuit speedrun where fans had a 10-day window to play the course as many times as they liked and submit their best times, competing against the entire world via online leaderboards. A few weeks later, Nintendo released a second tournament, racing through 10 rings as fast as possible. The third tournament was knocking three top men off the edge of Galaxy Coliseum, and the fourth was speedrunning through Mushroom Gorge backwards, starting at the end and heading back to the start. Over the next two years, a total of 48 tournaments were released, like speedrunning a track built on top of N64 Skyscraper, killing a giant pokey, and racing through some remixed tracks. But unlike Mission Mode, you could only play two tournaments a month, and they were only available during that 10-day window. Mario Kart DS had 63 missions to choose from any time you wanted, so if Mission Mode wasn't cut from Mario Kart Wii, it likely would have included even more missions and added hours of rank-based content that could still be accessed right from the startup menu. Unfortunately, tournaments became completely inaccessible after Nintendo shut down Mario Kart Wii's online servers in 2014, exactly 10 days before the launch of Mario Kart 8 on Wii U. The shutdown also killed off the game's leaderboards and brought an end to online racing. But diehard fans refused to let the game die and quickly set up their own custom server called Wimfi, resurrecting online racing and even restoring most tournaments. Tens of thousands of fans around the world use Wimfi, and they've even added brand new content, including more than 200 custom racetracks. Many of the tracks are completely original, like the campground-themed Camp Cardigan, but a lot of them are based on video game franchises like Pokemon and even Super Monkey Ball. Several were inspired inspired by Mario games, like one set in Mario Odyssey's Luncheon Kingdom, and another based on the Honey Hive from Mario Galaxy. Fans also spent several years remaking all the old tracks from previous Mario Kart games, like Mario Kart DS's Shroom Ridge. We spoke to one of the custom track Grand Prix primary developers, Mr. Bean, the same guy who discovered Mission Mode, and he told us they've got more tracks currently in development, and are in the beta stage of doubling online multiplayer from 12 players to 24 simultaneous racers on a single track. They've also implemented an in-game game speedometer, a feature missing from the official release. But it's not just the online scene that's running on all cylinders, the competitive scene's bigger now than it ever was during the Wii era. In July 2020, the Mario Kart Wii World Cup drew in 21 national racing teams and tens of thousands of spectators, making it the most viewed Mario Kart competition of all time. And event organizers told Digino Gaming that plans for the 2021 World Cup are already well underway. Every vehicle in Mario Kart Wii has unique stats clearly visible on the vehicle select screen, but every character also has unique stats, but those stats are hidden and never actually revealed to the player. Lightweights get knocked around by the big guys, so they're not competitively viable. When it comes to heavyweights, Waluigi has the best acceleration, Dry Bowser the best off-road, and Funky Kong the fastest, making him the natural choice for speed freaks. The Flame Runner bikes got the best mix of speed and drift, so about 80% of World Cup participants use the Funky Kong Flame Runner combo. There's also a very obscure and interesting glitch in the game, where if the player is currently playing playing online as Player 2, and someone else is in the lobby using a heavy male Mi Outfit A on either the Wario Bike, the Shooting Star, or the Phantom, then their Mi will be constantly in a T-pose. The reason this happens is because the developers forgot to put the Mi back in the sitting back position in several files. This doesn't happen for the player's own Mi, or anywhere else in the game. Did you know? Super Mario 128 was the last game Shigeru Miyamoto ever directed, or at least it would have been, if its development was ever completed. Mario 128's development has long been a controversial and confusing topic with lots of misinformation online. To clear things up, Did You Know Gaming searched through hundreds of magazines, translated Japanese websites, and even got in contact with one of Miyamoto's top programmers, Giles Goddard, who shed some light on the project. Mario 128 wasn't just one game with a linear development, it was actually several prototypes by multiple EAD teams as part of one massive project. You might think that sounds unusual, but it's the same way Mario 64 was made. According to Godard, this multi-prototype development process was exactly how all the other prototypes and games came into being at Nintendo EAD. So let's dig into Mario 128's decade-long development and set the record straight. 
At E3 1996, just after Mario 64's development was complete, Miyamoto revealed that a sequel was already on the way. Miyamoto said, I couldn't put everything into Mario 64 that I really wanted, so we've decided to continue working toward a sequel, which will take about a year and a half at least. He later added, the game is only using about 60% of the N64's hardware power you see. There's really so much more we could do, so we decided to save those ideas for next time. Over the course of many interviews, Miyamoto explained that Mario 64 only used a fraction of the N64's potential because the tools and hardware powering it weren't made by Nintendo themselves. They were actually developed by American companies like Silicon Graphics Inc., who gave Nintendo instruction manuals written in English. As a result, Nintendo's Japanese programmers couldn't take full advantage of the N64's capabilities in its first wave of 3D games. According to Miyamoto, all that untapped power could be used to make enemies more intelligent, so when the sequel the new enemies would react to Mario's attacks in more varied and interesting ways. Mario 128 would utilize more advanced lighting and special effects as seen in Ocarina of Time, a game that ran on Mario 64's engine but with 90% of the N64's power. Miyamoto also planned to take advantage of the all-new tech in the 64DD, the N64's disc-based add-on, such as the extra storage space from discs. Miyamoto frequently mentioned the 64DD's read and write capabilities, saying he was using the DD's read-write storage to make a whole new type of game. The DD's other big feature was internet access, which combined with the read-and-write function could have truly revolutionized 3D Mario. Another way Miyamoto wanted to revolutionize 3D Mario was by resurrecting Luigi, who was unfortunately cut from Mario 64 late in development. Miyamoto was determined to bring Luigi back to life in the sequel, but not just as a function of multiplayer. Mario 128 single-player was built around the concept of control controlling Mario and Luigi simultaneously. Miyamoto never fully explained the specifics, but presumably this would mean splitting up Mario and Luigi to hit switches and solve puzzles, while at other times working together to push blocks and combine their abilities in other unique situations. In other words, it probably would have been something like Pikmin 2 or Resident Evil Zero, games where the player controls two main characters, sometimes together and sometimes separately, with the ability to switch from one character to the other at the press of a button. In early 19 1998, Miyamoto told reporters Mario 128 was in the middle of development and that he even had a prototype starring Mario and Luigi sitting on his desk. He jokingly added that the final game might have green box art in honor of Luigi. He also assured fans Mario 128 would be finished fairly quickly once his team dedicated their efforts to it, but first they needed to wrap up development on Zelda 64, which at the time was scheduled to release about six months later. Unfortunately, things didn't go as planned and six Six months of finishing up Zelda turned into a year and a half, leaving Mario 128 to gather dust on Miyamoto's desk. Development came to a complete standstill, mostly because Miyamoto insisted on directing the game himself. This was at a time when he already had his hands full supervising about 10 other games, including the Mario Artist series and Star Fox 64. Eventually it dawned on him that he had bitten off more than he could chew and admitted as much in late 1998, saying, The prototype of Mario 2 has been kept on my desk and remains untouched. Luigi and Mario are running on the display I have. Originally, I wanted to make it for the DD system but haven't touched it because of Zelda. Maybe I could ask a different group to work on it for me or perhaps we could make it a new system but right now I don't know. By now Mario 128 had missed its opportunity to launch on Nintendo's first 3D console and footage of the Luigi prototype was never made public but Miyamoto wasn't ready to give up so once Ocarina of Time was released in late 1998 he turned his attention back to Mario 128 with a flurry of new ideas. Development was officially switched from the 64DD to the GameCube and throughout dozens of interviews, Miyamoto revealed bits and pieces about the new direction the game was taking. When Nintendo Power asked if Mario 128 would accommodate two players, he told them his team was actually exploring four player split screen. Four tiny screens would require a new camera system, but Miyamoto assured fans he was up to the challenge. Nintendo Official Magazine and other reputable sources reported on insider rumors that in addition to Luigi, Peach and Toad would be playable as well. Two staffers who worked on Mario 64 
claimed Yoshi was scrapped during development and was planned to return in the sequel. Claims made more credible when unseen Yoshi assets, including a Yoshi egg in Wet Dry World, were discovered in Mario 64's internal data some years later. Starting in late 1999, Miyamoto began to express frustration with Mario's reputation as a kid's game. He originally made the character as a typical middle-aged man back in the 80s, but over the next two decades, Nintendo's marketing department gradually turned him into a more silly character aimed mostly at children. As a result, it had become common for Japanese kids to feel they'd grown out of Mario games by the time they reached middle school, so he declared Mario would stop using the peace sign or victory sign even though it was considered Mario's trademark gesture at the time, and no more smiling and laughing for no good reason. That was kid stuff. Miyamoto made it clear that Mario 128 would have more mature graphics and a more grown-up Mario. He even granted a few interviews to Playboy Weekly to drive the point home, promising Mario 128 would deliver a fresh new experience. At Space World 2000 in Japan, Miyamoto finally gave the public their first peek at Mario 128. But it wasn't his old Luigi prototype. Instead, he showed off a brand new prototype directed by Yoshiaki Koizumi, who'd served as Miyamoto's assistant director on Mario 64. The game had 128 Marios running around a giant 3D game board carrying blocks and pushing each other off the edge, and came to a finale when the board exploded into a giant pizza. At the time, it was presented as a tech demo called Mario 128, demonstrating the capabilities of Nintendo's new home console, the GameCube. But Miyamoto later told Nintendo Power and other outlets that even though certain elements of the demo found their way into Pikmin, it was still very much in development as its own game. Over the next few years, Miyamoto's team explored different ideas by co-developing two separate prototypes. One was referred to as the Mario 128 Project, and the other was an evolution of the Space World demo called the 100 Mario Mario's project. Meanwhile, Yoshiaki Koizumi was put in charge of a third Mario project, which ultimately launched in 2002 as Super Mario Sunshine. Over the next couple years, Miyamoto continued to reassure fans that both Mario 128 projects were developing nicely, and one of them would end up as Mario 64's direct sequel on the GameCube. Now seven years into development, Mario 128 was expected to have a showing at E3 2003, but the event came and went without Mario making so much as a peep. Miyamoto later claimed 128 took a leave of absence to prevent other developers from stealing the game's revolutionary ideas. He said, With Mario 128, I have been challenging many unprecedented things not found in existing video games. These new ideas are prone to lose their freshness or to be imitated once they go public. So we must be extremely careful when we discuss such things. I have been feeling the pressure that I have to complete this project. He later told Electronic Gaming Monthly if he didn't show the game sometime in 2004, he'd consider himself a failure. But again, 2004 came and went. Updates slowed to a trickle until the following year's E3 when Miyamoto told reporters Mario 128 might not land on the GameCube after all. After not directing a game for eight years since Mario 64, he also admitted he was struggling as the game's only director. Soon after, Miyamoto announced he was taking an indefinite break from 128's development. Over the next few years, his team continued experimenting and building new prototypes, but Miyamoto had clearly lost enthusiasm for the project. He diverted attention to his work as a producer, supervising the development of games like Twilight Princess, Wii Sports, and Super Paper Mario. Meanwhile, Yoshiaki Koizumi and the Sunshine team opened a new office in Tokyo and took control of the 100 Mario's project. After spending three months reworking the 100 Mario's prototype to take place on a planet, Miyamoto gave Koizumi his blessing to start development on what would become Super Mario Galaxy. To the disappointment of millions of fans, Super Mario 128 was finally declared dead on March 8, 2007. In his keynote speech at the annual Game Developers Conference, Miyamoto offered up a final status report on Mario 64's direct sequel, a game that 10 years ago he said would only take a year and a half to make. Simply put, Mario 128's gameplay centering on 100 plus AI controlled characters became Pikmin, and the stage design became Mario Galaxy. 
End of story. After that, reporters stopped asking about Mario 128, and Miyamoto seemed happy to never talk about it ever again. However, the truth appears to be more complicated. 100 Marios, a project within Mario 128, became Pikmin and Galaxy. But what about everything else? The unused content from Mario 64, the Luigi prototype, and all the other prototypes his team tinkered with for over a decade. Some of the unused content, like Luigi, made its way back into Mario 64 when it was re-released on the Nintendo DS. The Luigi prototype possibly went on to inspire the end of the cafe side quest in Majora's Mask, then later served as the basis for Alomar and Louie's campaign in Pikmin 2. Rideable Yoshis found a home in Sunshine, and the four-player campaign co-op ended up in Super Mario 3D World. It's hard to definitively say what became of the more mature graphics, but the peace sign did end up getting banned from Mario Sunshine, as well as the Galaxy games. That said, it ultimately returned in Super Mario Odyssey. In the end, the only thing released to the public actually called Super Mario 128 was an event match found in Smash Bros. Melee. But little bits and pieces of 128 snuck their way into other games Miyamoto produced, and all those countless Mario prototypes like Sunshine 2 experiments on the Wii will probably go on to influence future Nintendo games in ways we don't even realize. Today we're exploring cases of plagiarism relating to the Mario franchise, or at least what could be described as overreaching inspiration. The games industry is of course a creative medium, and to ignore the work of others would be foolish. It's healthy for one game to be inspired by another, but sometimes the level of influence steps over the line. The first game we're looking at comes from a market full of plagiarism, the world of mobile gaming. Mole Kart was created by the Chinese company Shanghai Shengran Information Technology and was released on both iOS and Android devices in 2012. Although it seemed to be a fairly simple and innocent kart racer, the title didn't hang around on the app stores for long, as a copyright claim was made against the title by Nintendo. The claim was based on gameplay trailers which seemed to include graphical assets that were far too similar to those from the Mario Kart series for it to be a simple coincidence. In particular, several settings, items and course maps look nigh on identical to those found in Mario Kart Wii, including courses like Peach Beach, Mushroom Gorge, and Moo Moo Meadows. The copyright claim struck the game from the mobile storefronts, but it wouldn't be long before the game reappeared, being released under a different title, Mole Kart 1. Many reviews claimed that the game was actually pretty decent, all things considered, despite it being a very obvious ripoff of Mario Kart. By the end of 2012, a sequel had already been developed and released, Mole Kart 2 Evolution. Many agreed that the sequel was a good direction for the franchise, moving away from being a Mario Kart clone and away from the plagiarism in general. Another mobile game exclusive to Android devices is Era's Adventures 3D, created by Andev. The game puts the player in control of Era, a green dinosaur who looks more than slightly similar to the much beloved Yoshi, though with the power to shoot flaming mucus. Released in February of 2013, the title is extremely basic, with the main draw being in its inclusion of a cute dinosaur character. It would be just two weeks before Nintendo took legal action against the title. Boton Corpax, a member of the game's development team who was heavily involved in its creation, claimed to actually not be a fan of the Super Mario series and as such was completely unaware of Yoshi's existence. He told Ars Technica, Actually, this is an indie game developed by one developer, so due to the limitation of effort, I purchased a cute character from Turbo Squid, one of the biggest 3D asset stores, without knowing the background story of the character Yoshi, since I'm not a Super Mario fan. Once the game was released on the Play Store, after spending hundreds of hours in making the game, I started receiving kind mails from Super Mario fans that I stole Yoshi, etc. So I started googling and realized that the character is really from the Super Mario series. The game was removed from the Google Play Store for a short while, but it appeared again with an entirely new design for ERA. But this wouldn't save the title entirely, as it was removed permanently only a few months later. The game made a reappearance in 2014 under the new title of Jack 3D, taking ERA out of the equation and replacing the less original dinosaur with a slightly more original dog. Of course, both of these cases involved games making use of Mario assets, but plagiarism doesn't have to be games copying games. 
In January of 2019, the Chinese government actually stole from the Big N, taking several objects from Super Mario Bros. for use in a political video. To list all of the assets taken directly from Nintendo's video game would be too extensive, though it includes graphics, Mario's head, and sound effects all from the Chinese Supreme People's Court, one of the highest courts in the country. You know, the place that should be trying to uphold the law. The fake game, Super Mario Mr. Judge 2018, was created as a way of showing off how many cases the court had heard back in 2018. Whilst the artwork for Mario's head is a presumed original drawing, the background, enemies, sound effects, music, most of the video is directly ripped from the Mario original. Mario even encounters what seems to be a tiger who sounds like Wario. Oh, yeah. <laughs> While the video would eventually be deleted from Weibo, the Chinese video streaming service, it does beg the question of whether China's courts take copyright infringement seriously when they themselves are involved in the practice. But hey, you think China is the only country to commercially use assets that they own no rights to? Well, think again. It was revealed in 2019 that the United States Environmental Protection Agency had stolen music from Yoshi's Island DS, making an appearance in a Flash game that they had created called Recycle City Challenge. The game was actually made several years earlier, but had gone unnoticed for a long time. A spokesman from the EPA commented on the situation, stating that the game was created for the agency by a contractor, and that they were looking into whether the contractor received permission to use the music to the extent the permission was necessary in this instance. We're willing to bet that they had not, as the music was quickly removed from the game. These previous cases are all rather recent, but the copying of Nintendo's Mario series has been going on since the original title released back in the 80s. The Great Gianna Sisters was developed by Time Warp Productions and published by German studio Rainbow Arts in 1987 on the Commodore 64, before being ported to several other systems. In the game, the player takes on the role of Gianna, a girl who has found herself in a world of monsters after falling asleep. She must run, jump and platform her way through this strange world, looking for a hidden diamond which will wake her up. On release, it was immediately apparent to many players that the game wasn't exactly filled with entirely original designs. Not only are the game's graphics almost identical to Super Mario Bros., but so too is the game's first level. The game itself is even self-referential of its intentionally replicative manner, with some versions of the game's box art featuring the line, The Brothers Are History. Nintendo became aware of the game's existence and put pressure on the developers to pull the game from store shelves, with the game eventually being taken off of sale, leading to its rarity as a collector's item. A sequel had already been in development around the original's release, titled Gianna 2 Arthur and Martha in Future World. As can be expected, with the legal issues surrounding the first game's release, several assets were altered for the sequel, including the title, which would be renamed Hard and Heavy. Nintendo still felt it was their duty to suppress the game's spread, however, and stopped it from having a release within the United Kingdom, though it did see publication in a smaller circulation in a few other countries. The franchise would lay dormant for a long time, until 2009 when a sequel was created for Nintendo's DS. With its success as a limited series, seeing no pushback from Nintendo, a second game was also crowdfunded and developed called Gianna Sisters Twisted Dreams. As a change of pace though, it isn't just other companies that plagiarized, Nintendo has even done it themselves. After the Super Mario Bros. Encyclopedia was published in 2018, it wasn't long before it was revealed that one of the book's translators had taken unofficial or unconfirmed names of several characters from websites. These included the Super Mario Wiki and Mario Wikia. This means that some of the contents of this book is actually inaccurate, as several enemies had never had their English names revealed, and so the book uses their conjectural names created by fans, or simply just their names in another language, as used by the Super Mario Wiki for the character's page prior to an English name being given. Did you also know that a sequel to Super Mario 64 and a Pokemon RPG were planned for the N64 but cancelled? For more insight, watch our video on cancelled N64 games.